Testing one, two. Yeah, there we go. Oh, cool. If you're just joining us, this is Blue Shift. I am Seth, and we will be testing, not launching, in approximately 45 minutes. Something like that. There are error bars on that estimate. going well, thank you. And yourself. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's just us here. <laughs> Ask away. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Get often. Um, we do have interns, um, and uh, I'll, I'll thank a couple of them later, just because they were, you know, integral to help with the rocket. Uh, we don't do that. We don't manage that in house. We go through the Main Space Grant Consortium, and they have uh, internships for uh, high school students and undergrads and college. And uh, so that's how we've uh, done all of our internships. probably for the future as well. I can, uh, I can pop a link in the chat here in just a moment. Go. There's the link. Best of luck as you apply and in your studies and everything moving forward. That internship, um, the Aerospace Workforce Development Program, that's undergrad. Uh, we haven't done a high school internship yet. What do we use for the propellant? Another excellent question. Uh, it is proprietary, so I, I can't share that. Uh, but it is biodrived. Uh, it is non-toxic. Wouldn't oversell it as being edible, but if you were to eat it, um, nothing would really happen. <laughs> uh, you know, um, in terms of blue shift, that uh, uh, they, they usually um, there's more stone masonry than, than, than coffee getting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a different kind of game. For, uh, for my job interview, I dug our, our first ever flame trench coming off the test stand. ISP, another really excellent question. I'm not sure that I can talk about that at length, um, but I can say that we met
met all of our benchmarks um, for the for the NASA grant last year, uh, which included ISP requirements. Oh, thanks. Just joining us. Testing one, two. Yeah, there we go. Oh, cool. If you're just joining us, this is Blue Shift. I am Seth. And we will be testing, not launching, in approximately 45 minutes. There are error bars on the list. Payload for the upcoming launch. Um, you're going to have four 3U uh, CubeSat enclosures. So our, our enclosures, because um, we, we make them, and then we ship them to the oh, customer. Yeah. They fill it up yeah, Julia, and then return the, uh, the enclosure. So our enclosure is actually, when, when I say 3U, what I mean is our enclosure is big enough to hold a 3U CubeSat. So it's actually slightly bigger around. Um, and that's uh, 10, so it could hold a 10 by 10 by 30 centimeter uh, small satellite. Or, uh, if you didn't want to just make your own it's small satellite, well, then you could, you could use the extra space that we give you in the enclosure um, and, you know, cram a couple extra things in there. Yeah, go ahead. It's just us. Uh, so we've got four payloads. One of them Ask is uh, pens that we're going to hand out to uh, special guests after the after the launch of the moon sounds, space tent. And then we've got a uh, uh, customer payload. And, uh, uh, we do uh, have Kellogg's we research uh, uh, We're going to be testing uh, I think a couple uh, of the material just because they were you know, to go to help with uh, the data. They're working on the hope to uh, see we don't, do that, we don't manage that uh, in house. We go through the main space consortium. Using CubeSats down there. And they have uh, some high school or we find payload. High school students, uh, and their grads, and college kind of a tech project. So that's how we kids uh, all of our internships uh, and Rocket Insights, probably uh, software developer. We'll also be flying. Oh, okay. Chat. Interesting. Anyway, the Rocket Insights payload is very exciting, very special. I'm giving an interview, aren't I? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so I, uh, I had kind of an amp across the room, which I've now turned down. Is, is the echo gone? Is the reverb gone? Roger 10. This just in from intern Ben. Uh, T minus 10 minutes to test. I have to get out of the muscle memory of saying T minus to launch because we are not going to be launching anything today. I'll take this moment to uh, kind of give you a tour. Um, briefly, the flight, flight profile is uh, the engine's going to fire. Uh, and so this is this is for the launch, which is going to be at least one week from now, depending on the results of this test. So, um, oh, I can't share that one. But the uh, the flight, pilot, flight profile is engine fires for 11 seconds, glide for 11 seconds at apogee or 4,000 feet, or maybe a little higher. At that point, uh, it'll separate, 
So you have the payload section and the engine section, just like a model rocket, but uh, about 600 pounds fully fueled. Drogue chute comes out, orients everything so that it's uh, in a good configuration for when the main chute deploys right above the ground. The engine section will touch down first so that the parachute can decelerate the payload section even more for a really nice soft touchdown, uh, at which point we'll recover the payloads. Now for the test today, we're going to fire the engine at full power for about 11 seconds. Uh, the engine will not move anywhere. And, uh, actually, here, let me show you the engine now. There you have it. Got the test stand. And there's the flame trench down below. And basically in the center, we have the, uh, the engine. And uh, it's restrained in place. We have here the launch trailer and the launch tower that uh, we also fabricated service arms there on either side. Uh, what is the solar for? Another excellent question. Uh, we have an off-grid test stand. Uh, this thing is powered by the sun. Control room here, we've got Luke and Brooke. Looks like a couple guests there. Oh, I actually don't know, I just work here. <laughs> Good question though. My God, eight viewers. Eight viewers, that's crazy. Thanks for joining us. This is uh, Blue Shift Airspace static fire test of our Marvel engine, which will power the Stardust 1.0 in a small suborbital hop sometime soon. This is just the test. What we have here is a top-down view of that engine. You can see the surface arms on either side. It's kind of cool. And we'll have a top-down view and the best side view here for the actual test. The last report, uh, based on it, we're at about T minus eight minutes until the test. Uh, that figure may jump around a little bit. Do we do cryo? Killing it with the question, sir. These are awesome. Um, or madam. So we don't do cryo.
nothing here is cryogenic, which is ironic because um, unlike the, the vast majority of rockets that use cryogenic propellant, uh, we can launch in the winter in northern Maine. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, no, we, we basically store stuff at room temperature or, uh, you know, give or take tens of degrees. So, uh, yeah, no, nothing's cryogenic, which makes the fuel, the rocket, the training, the handling, all of it, you know, safer, faster, cheaper, much cheaper. You may see vapor, um, either from the, uh, the oxidizer or certainly from, uh, there's a carbon dioxide flush after the engine fires. Um, partially to cool down the components, mainly to cool down the components. And then also it would you know, suppress any, any fire that was still going. But mostly cooling is the concern. So you'll definitely see vapor for the CO2 flush. Is it a hybrid? Absolutely. Solid fuel, liquid oxidizer. question about active control. That's a good one. Um, our larger rockets uh, are going to have clusters of these engines. Okay, back. So yeah, uh, active control will be achieved because we're going to have clusters of engines on our, on our larger rockets, not just one. And so we'll be able to throttle them uh, differentially. That would be nice, the, uh, the control we need. Oh, no, that, that's, that's my new favorite question. Can we thank the person who runs the Twitter? Uh, that's me. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad, it, uh, I'm glad it resonates. So much, yeah. It's uh, it's been really exciting to to just see everything coming together. It's crazy. It's it, going off off script a little bit here. It is the most amazing and surreal experience to go to work and just have a rocket in the other room. thrust vectoring. Um, 
Meaning, does the engine move around, basically? Uh, no. No, not for this flight, and the plan is not to do that for the future. Um, the concept is that just we're going to save on, on moving parts. That which can move can break, right? So the preference is going to be to control the oxidizer flow through the different engines um, differentially. And then, you know, the side of the rocket that's getting more thrust is going to kind of pitch away from that side, right? Well, um, think about like a two-engine aircraft, right? Like twin engine, uh, if you lose one engine, you're going to have to trim the yaw pretty hard in one direction and, of course, find the nearest airport uh, because you're only getting thrust on one side, right? And so your nose is going to tend to go kind of in the, move away from the engine kind of, right? Uh, in fact, there's one aircraft where uh, they actually they lost tail control totally but they had both engines still, and they were able to turn the aircraft just by throttling the engines differently. So we won't have uh, quite as much of a radius there to, to use a torque over. But we're going to cluster seven engines. You want to turn in one direction. You just throttle up the three on one side and down the three on the other, and you go. Yaw. Roll, of course, you won't really have. But for an unmanned suborbital flight, I mean, it'll have, it'll have fins, so it's not like it's going to be, you know, rolling wildly or anything like that. Yeah, reaction wheels could come into the picture, absolutely. KSP music in the future, um, I'd be open to it if we could get permission from the publisher. Wind in the mic. Okay. Let's test something real quick. Okay. How's the sound now? Is it any better? got an FM transmitter hooked up to this system. Folks that might be in the parking lot. Because it's in car view and you know, so folks are tuning in with their radios. I believe that's what's introducing the buzz.
if you're just joining us. Scoosh at their space live stream. There's the Stardust 1.0 static fire test. I'm Seth, the comms guy. In the control room, we have Luke and Brooke going over the numbers. Our revised figures, we're at about uh, T minus 20 minutes to test here. And Ben has entered the control room. The oxygen tank is, uh, well, oxidizer tank is pressurizing. This is uh, always a always a big moment. It's really uh, it's really happened. joined by friends and family. Thank you so much for your support. For the comments, I, uh, I can confirm that the oxidizer is not the secret, but it is uh, a secret. the construction of Stardust 1.0 over the past couple of months. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. You can just see some of the things that we've been up to. It might surprise you, you know, there's a lot of parts of building a rocket that you don't necessarily think about. Like uh, weighing it. And to make sure that it weighed within a couple of pounds of what we estimated, and it did. What's the airframe made of? The 
skin is a composite material and paint, which seems kind of obvious, but painting a rocket is a, a, a real undertaking. The skeleton is uh, steel. Correction outside of the engine is uh, primarily aluminum, although there is still the skeleton as well. And we have a revised estimate on that testing time. We're looking at about 
20 minutes. So right around the past the time, I've uh, got a, a brief history of Blue Shift. So, uh, I'll go over that. Here's our side and top-down views of the marble. You can kind of tell that it's going to be sunset soon. encourage everyone who can to, uh, to get out and, and see Jupiter and Saturn in, in conjunction. Absolutely beautiful sight. So, Blue Shift got started back in 2014. Um, around mid-year, Sasha Derry, our, our CEO and founder, was uh, getting into this hobby of rocketry. Uh, testing on a kind of a horizontal static fire uh, stand on a farm here in the Stumbled across this energy dense solid fuel, burned clean. Well, it releases CO2, I mean, it is combustion, right? But it absorbs CO2 when we make it. And, uh, you know, scale can be a real issue with these hybrid motors. Um, 
as your engine gets larger, um, essentially the shape of the reaction chamber is changing more over time as the fuel is away. So this thing is uh, never going to be on the scale of a Saturn V, probably. But on a smaller scale, there is this emerging market launching these tiny satellites, CubeSats, 10 centimeters to a satellite, or multiples of that. And even back then, there was in, uh, there were some pain points in the industry. People had to wait over a year to launch, which means that even if you have, if your school has the budget, you know, this isn't a good senior project because it's a big more than a year to launch. A lot of folks with small satellites, they're not the primary payload. Like we're on track for that 3 p.m. So folks weren't necessarily getting, you know, the orbit that they wanted. They weren't necessarily getting to launch when they wanted for these small satellites. And so this industry is going to start taking off, right? And as you do that, there's an opportunity here in this, in this fuel to help offset the carbon footprint of this new industry as it develops. So uh, Sasha moved on this whole concept and the company was incorporated in 24, or 2014. In 2016, that's when we moved back to Maine. Sasha was raised here. Um, and like almost everybody on our team, he had to move away at some point to uh, to work in his in his field in STEM. And uh, we were brought back by the Maine Technology Institute, tech place at the Mid Coast Regional Redevelopment Authority here in Brunswick. And uh, and so they helped us move to our, our current location. Um, at that point, there was over 200. Uh, horizontal static fire tests and a little like a two-inch engine. In 2017, we built the vertical test stand, uh, the tower, which um, is off screen right now, but you can see parts of it. Other videos on YouTube will show the engine, um, I guess you could say not in a flight configuration basically a little bit more spread out for maintenance purposes and bolted to the wall of the, of the test stand. First test of a four inch uh, engine was also in 2017. Um, by 2018, we were getting uh, pretty much the, the maximum thrust that we could out of a four inch, so it was time to scale up to the six inch diameter engine that we'll be testing today. That marvel first fired in 2019 and it is about to fire again. Word from the control room. The test will be soon. Thank you. 
MARVEL stands for Modular Adaptable Rocket Engine. Joining us, Blue Shift Airspace, Seth, we're about to test the Marvel, a modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch that will power Stardust 1.0 in flight out of Warring Commerce Center in the near future. The test is imminent any minute now. Control room is buzzing. Brooke giving the camera a friendly wave. As so we are now approximately three minutes from the engine test. Terribly sorry about the music. Thanks for asking about the uh, the buzzer. Uh, I didn't hear anything here, and there's no issues reported with Marvel, um, so it's possible that sound was 
coming from somewhere nearby. And, uh, somehow I missed it. But all systems are go. Just a few minutes from the test now. All right, all systems go. Test imminent. Engine is armed. You may hear our warning buzzer. And there is an anomaly with the Marvel. So we are now holding. Let the engineers check that thing out. You can see them working the problem in the control room. Yeah, to clarify. Well, I don't know if you heard that, but to clarify, uh, we're not scrubbing the test, uh, but we went into a hold here. Uh, looks like the anomaly should be resolved, and we should be able to test the engine in under a minute.
if you're just joining us. This is Blue Shift Airspace. Live, uh, live stream of the static fire test. For Marvel Engine. Modular standing for modular, sorry. <laughs> Marvel standing for modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. This engine will power our prototype rocket, Stardust 1.0, in flight. Uh, in Commerce Center in the coming weeks. This is our final test before we uh, declare Stardust 1.0 flight ready. It's a really big milestone, culmination of almost seven years of hard work. The test itself is imminent. If you're just joining us, this is Blue Shift Airspace live stream of the static fire test of our Marvel engine. Marvel standing for modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. And we had to abort our most recent attempt at the test. There's difficulty uh, getting the igniter to fire. So we're working the problem now. see our team reviewing the data here in the control room and uh, this is not like a full scrub but the plan is that we will be attempting this test again I'll have an estimate to you as soon as I can in the meantime let me address some of these questions uh, that we've got in the comments Really, really good questions, guys. Thank you so much.
Right, so someone asked, uh, how do you think small site companies like this will be affected by the advent of fully reusable, super heavy launch vehicles? That's uh, something that's a little hard to predict. But I would make the argument that there's always going to be room for small business. For somebody that wants to launch a CubeSat as a primary payload, have input over where their orbits um, going to be and when. And, uh, and that a small launch vehicle will be better able to cater to that little corner of the industry for a long time. So our plan really isn't to compete directly with SpaceX or Blue Origin or even Rocket Lab. Um, we're, if if uh, those guys are the, the freight trains to space or the bus to space respectively, we, we want to be the Uber to space. If you're just joining, this is Blue Shift Airspace. I'm Seth. We are about five minutes away from our test.
test of the Marvel engine that will power Stardust 1.0 in flight. This is the final test before we launch from the Marine Commerce Center up in the uh, Reason for uh, the, uh, the last test being uh, aborted there, the anomaly had to do with the igniter. Uh, there was a sequencing issue, and so it's been resolved in the, in the programming. And so moving forward, uh, what the hope did is it, uh, we allowed the, uh, the oxidizer to cool a little bit. So we're heating it back up. That's what the, uh, the pause is for now. And uh, with this issue resolved, should the all systems go? And testing in about four minutes now. You may hear the buzzer here in a couple moments. Uh, we're not going to fire the engines after this time. I'm just testing the sequencing.
if you're uh, just joining us, this is the Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of our Marvel engine test. Marvel standing for modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. And this Marvel will power the Stardust 1.0 prototype in flight from our Commerce Center. coming weeks. Now, uh, we did not wind up going all the way through with uh, the last uh, test. There was an issue in the sequencing and the igniter did not fire. Uh, the engineers are troubleshooting now. You can see them at work. So we'll have a new uh, timeline for you, just as soon as we can. Thank everybody for your patience. Uh, this kind of thing is, is part and parcel. And uh, we're just not editing it out. Although there will be a polished product, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a YouTube video that just shows the, the test. And outside, you look at this uh, little green ribbon, you can see the wind is picking up here in Brunswick, Maine. Oh, the wings picking up is not of significance to the test. I see the comment. I've done the static fire test. Uh, yeah, certainly not at these speeds. It's just interesting to me. From this top-down view, you can see uh, kind of to the lower right corner of the screen the blue nose cone of Stardust 1.0, as well as the payload bay and the flight computer on that kind of table. And we're sending commands to the flight computer um, over the network. From the top-down view of the Marvel, you can see a little staff meeting outside near the launch trailer. We are holding for another attempt at the engine test. 
So we'll get that estimate to you just as soon as we can. Uh, we have not fired yet. Just holding until uh, we can resolve the anomaly in the igniter sequencing. Do a full test, an 11 second burn. Thank you so much to all our viewers and all, for all the support in the chat. It's really amazing to see. Our fingers are all crossed too. We don't have a countdown estimate right now. Uh, the engineers are working to resolve that sequencing issue on the igniter. to test, again, the uh, sequencing, and depending on the results, uh, we'll then attempt another fix or do a full test. So it should be just a few minutes, but we'll, we'll have a, a figure for you after this kind of pre-test. Here, here, that it is amazing to see New England getting a spaceport. We are very excited. We don't want to just build rockets in here, we want to launch from me. In part because New could easily be the best place on the East Coast. Maybe the entire US to, uh, to launch to a polar orbit. Advantages of launching from Maine. Absolutely, I can. So, when you're launching, the big safety concern is ocean overflight. You don't want to be going over any population centers, any roads, anything like that. Uh, you want to be in a situation where you could have a catastrophic failure of the launch vehicle, and nobody would be or anything worse. So uh, that's why the vast majority of launches occur over the ocean. Now, if you want to launch to a polar orbit, you need to cancel out Earth's rotational velocity. The equator, it's something like a thousand miles an hour, a little bit over that. From Washington County, it would be just about 740 miles per hour. So that's about 300 miles an hour that you don't have to cancel out. So that's nice. And then you've got that ocean overflight for something like 1,800 miles. So it's, uh, it's really good for safety. Another good reason to launch from Maine is uh, 
It's connected to the contiguous U.S. Uh, it's got a terrific hospitality industry. And uh, you're never too far from a tech shop. You know, if you need to go to the hardware store or buy a new component, you know, there's, it's, it's, uh, it's not a big hike usually to get there compared to some other places that you might need to watch from. If you're just joining us, this is the Blue Shift Aerospace live stream. Uh, the Marvel test. Marvel standing for modular, adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. Successful. This Marvel will power power the uh, Stardust one point eight prototype in flight in the near future. And uh, good news from the control room, the sequencing issue has been resolved. So the uh, flight computer should be good to go. The igniter should be good to go. <laughs> Brooke is super excited for the launch, for the test. That's Sasha, the fearless leader. Also giving the camera a friendly wave. So with the anomaly resolved, um, it's probably about seven or eight minutes. We've got to warm the oxidizer again there, and then we will test. What is your anticipated payload capability on the Stardust rocket? Really good question from the feed. We can carry four 3U uh, CubeSats, so 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters. And in total, it's just shy of 20 pounds or so. Future rockets will be able to carry uh, more than that, up to 30 kilograms. Excuse me. Excitement building in the control room as the oxidizer 
approaches uh, nominal here. It's bringing the temperature up for the, uh, for the static fire test. A little bit about our team here. Uh, in the command chair is Brooke Halverson, our lead test engineer, responsible for performance testing logistics, manufacturer of the hybrid rocket motor and assembly. And we are five degrees from nominal. Just a few minutes. Behind Brooke in the door, doorway there. Luke Sandin, our senior mechanical engineer, assists with performance testing and is a uh, in charge of oxidizer system design and evaluation, lab code development, and staging simulations. Popping in and out of frame there is Sasha Derry, founded Blue Shift in 2014. And, uh, he's the boss. He's the man with the plan, the visionary. Also a splendid electrical engineer. Now within three degrees of nominal of the oxidizer tank. Some other folks to thank, David 
Rickian, our mechanical engineer, experienced in five axis and CNC milling, founder of Maccabee Tech and responsible for CAD and CAM development of our rocket motor components, development production processes as well. Matt Parker, technical advisor, experienced aerospace professional with a focus in test and launch operations for propulsion systems. He was involved in the development of the Merlin engine and the Rutherford engine. And we are now within one degree of nominal on the oxidizer tank. So it's time to shift gears. One of the nice things about One of the nice things about delays in testing is that, that many of our engine tests are framed by, by this just beautiful sunset in the background. We have nominal pressure. Final checks are completed. Uh, looks like some sort of issue with the igniter. 
I'll give you the details as I get them. Engineers are in discussion. So we did abort the test. It's not a full spread. We're still going to make another attempt. And the team is on it. Troubleshooting. Exactly why the igniter didn't go. So that's a reset on our countdown timer. But I can take this time to uh, answer some more questions. Got a question, uh, which is the main space grant consortium one in the way of requirements, um, which I'm guessing is, is about the spaceport. And uh, I wouldn't want to speak for them too, too much, other than in, in broad strokes. The um, goal is to have mission control and data storage and processing here in Brunswick, a vertical launch site. To, to sub-orbit and low-Earth orbit uh, at a to-be-determined down-east launch site, and suborbital launch based out of um, the former Limestone, oh, sorry, Loring Air Force Base, now Loring Commerce Center. From Loring, uh, you could also have horizontal launch, uh, kind of like Pegasus or like what, um, what Virgin Orbital is trying to do you have a, a small rocket uh, slung under a, an airplane such as a you know, 737. And so that kind of launch capacity could be developed with, with fairly little work as well. And presumably that could also be done out of, out of Brunswick, you know, if the, if the permitting worked out and everything. But for more information, um, Actually, I'll just post a link to, uh, to their most recent article on the subject.
Uh, Main Space Grant Consortium's requirements for an internship. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I was actually in, involved with them uh, in my youth, but never as an intern. So I just don't know. page that I linked earlier in the chat I may have that information though. Question of uh, update on the bill. It must be LD 2092. <laughs> and just a quick update from control. Got folks going out to the stand to assess the uh, igniter issue. Might need to sit tight, but I can still answer questions. I can still talk a little about Blue Shift and the team and the Stardust prototype. And we were covering LD twenty ninety two, uh, the resolve to establish the main spaceport complex leadership council. Now my understanding is that while the Idea B committee unanimously, and with bipartisan support, voted a lot to pass on the bill. It never made it to the floor due to uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And as a result, uh, such a bill would need to be reconsidered in the next session. Uh, also, the uh, bill sponsor Shanna uh, Bellows uh, is now a Secretary of State. So um, sponsorship, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, remains an open question. But it was amazing to see that kind of support from the state government for what we're trying to do, for trying to corner this emerging market in the next uh, industrial revolution. And, you know, create thousands of jobs and bring all kinds of tech dollars into the state. So it's definitely not the end of this story. Um, and uh, there's also been a forward motion in uh, along other vectors as well.
back in September, the Economic Development Administration and the Department of Commerce at the federal level invested over $400,000 to help develop a strategic plan for the main spaceport complex. That was matched with almost $150,000 in state funds and over $100,000 in local funds. So there's already a tremendous amount of interest in, uh, in seeing the spaceport come to fruition. What do Blue Shift interns do? Another good question. Really depends on the, uh, the intern's interests and skill sets and the kind of work that Blue Shift needs done at the time. Uh, we've had three interns so far. Those are some of the people I need to thank. Uh, James, Ben, and Kaylee. You guys, all three of you guys were, were amazing. And uh, no one of them did the same thing as any of the others. So it's really a, a, a varied thing. Solar panels in the frame of the test stand, yes. Um, those power the, the test stand. which uh, actually I'm not sure exactly how the test stand uh, may or may not be wired up to the, to the launch tower. But normally, power goes from those solar panels uh, into a battery bank, and from there it's used by the launch tower, or sorry, the test stand uh, as, as needed been a very good system for us. Uh, if you were to apply to Blue Shift, would you need a comprehensive knowledge of physics and calculus? No. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that I have that. Um, although, you know, if I, if I need it, I could probably cram for a few weeks and get back into practice. Um, but we're not all engineers here. It really does take all sorts. Um, we've got a, a, a PR consultant. We've got a, a, a team here um, taking some, some video for us. So there are, there are plenty of ways to get involved outside of just being an engineer and outside of just Blue Shift. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's opportunity if you're not, you know, the top of your class in, in math and physics. Uh, with that said, for, you know, on average, for just about any job at a rocket company, uh, being well-versed in those things, having a basis in them at least, is super important.
owner owned by Gerard Desjardins. Uh, Steve Savoy is our composites expert. And he focuses mainly on the this and the ever thrilling subfield of quality compliance. I just the components in the Stardust launch vehicle. So mainly that's the skin, the nose cone, the, uh, the tail fins. And helping pack recovery parachutes and gear. There's a really good video of him up on our social platforms. He is doing a documentary on our first launch. So thanks to them. Matt Hoffner is our entrepreneurial consultant. He's instrumental in painting our fuselage. George Story from the Marshall Space Flight Center has been a real, uh, just a, a fountain of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, George. Hybrid rocket technical expert. Carl Flora and Neil Haynes. Midcoast Regional Redevelopment Authority. Steve Levesque, Ben Sturdivant, and the whole team over there has just been amazing. Thanks to the Maine Technology Institute and the Maine Space Grant Consortium, especially the And here in the control room, the team is in vehicle on our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. 
So Stardust is a basic test bed launch vehicle for experiments requiring subjection to the vibrations and accelerations of launch and parachute recovery. It's ideal for student and budget payloads. It can reach a maximum altitude of 4,000 feet, or maybe 4,500. It'll exert about uh, two Gs of acceleration. Uh, it's not spin stabilized, so payload by diameter is just 14 inches, and the maximum payload mass is just about eight kilograms. Get about nine U's or so in there. Apologies. Twelve. So that'll take the form on this plane of three, sorry, four three U CubeSats. Vehicle height is 20 feet. Single stage, of course. It's a hybrid rocket engine. The Marvel or modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. Uh, in this instance, is about six inches in diameter. There are plans for up to 18. when we do for our mission goals or of course stand by
All right, if you're just joining us, uh, this is the blue stream. <laughs> it's been a long day. If you're just joining us, this is the Blue Shift Airspace live stream of our static fire tests with our Marvel engine. Marvel standing for modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. If successful, this Marvel will power the Stardust 1.0 prototype in flight from Limestone Commerce Center, Flooring Commerce Center. My apologies. Anomaly. From the uh, from the igniter, one issue was identified and resolved, and we're now diagnosing uh, another another issue, some sort of electrical issue with the igniter. Uh, the goal is to resolve the issue before five and test again, and uh, barring that. We'll wrap things up and try again, probably tomorrow. So we'll uh, get you that information. More on the story as it develops. So as we prepare for uh, the mission, which is a, a suborbital hop just to 4,000 feet, demonstration of our prototype rocket and biodrived fuel in flight. I couldn't tell you the last time somebody invented a new rocket fuel, uh, but I think it was a while back. Have we got to demonstrate the economic demand for suborbital launch, more time subject to launch uh, conditions. And of course to attract investors so that we can continue doing what we're doing just more and better. The flight plan goes something like a T0 ignition of course. Power will clear in about two seconds. The engine will fire for 11 seconds in total, so T plus 11, engine cutoff. It's tempting to call it Miko, but there's only one engine. At that point, Stardust would glide for another 11 seconds in near microgravity. It'll be low down enough that there will be air resistance, so it's not true microgravity at those altitudes. As the vehicle hits apogee, its highest point in flight above the ground, the payload bay will separate from the marble. They'll both be still in their skin attached by a tether. And uh, about a second later, the drogue chute will be just uh, not quite as massive. So from 22 to about 58 seconds, we'll have the payload bay, the rocket engine, suspended below the drogue chute. Everything will kind of redistribute, eave it out, settle into its lowest energy configuration as the descent goes on. And uh, about 58 seconds in, the main chute will deploy. At that point, the, uh, the, the whole system will, will drift to a soft touchdown at about a minute 25. And then something interesting happens. The marble is going to be suspended on a longer tether than the payload base. So it's going to be below the, um, the payload bay for the descent it's going to touch down first, meaning that for a few seconds, the main chute will really only be slowing the descent of the pearl, uh, the payload bay. And so the payload bay will have an opportunity to make a, uh, an even softer touchdown 
in the engine well. The system is reusable. The plan is to then uh, fly Stardust again, possibly in the late summer or early fall of next year. And at that point, it's time to move on to larger rockets. So after Stardust 1.0, it's time for Stardust 2.0. This rocket is going to have a maximum altitude of 40,000 feet, a maximum acceleration of 5 Gs, payload bay diameter of 24 inches. It's not going to be that much bigger though, it's only going to be about 21 feet in height. Still single stage. Our first two-stage rocket, Starless Rogue, is going to be our kind of state-of-the-art suborbital launcher. The first stage will be a cluster of those Marvel engines. The second stage will just be a single one. Now, starting with Stardust 2.0, our payload capacity is going to be 30 kilograms. And we're going to stick to that, whether it's suborbital, low or high, or to low Earth orbit, polar, or otherwise. 30 kilograms. So you, you probably won't be ride sharing with, uh, with too many people. The plan is for a, a pretty intense launch cadence, eventually to scale up to twice a month. So if a flight has to be scrubbed for some reason, worst case scenario, probably looking at about a two-week delay, which is, uh, you know, as space programs go, it's not too bad. Then, of course, there's low Earth orbit. That launch vehicle is called the Red Dwarf. Again, 30 kilograms to low Earth orbit. It will also accelerate at about 5 Gs the whole way up. This, uh, this vehicle will be about 78 feet high by our current models. Three stages to orbit. Each cluster with, uh, sorry, each stage with clusters of seven engines for the first and second stage. The third stage, cluster of four. Attitude control on Starless Rogue. So what I can say at this point is that that first stage is going to have a cluster of four marvels. So with differential throttling, be able to control its attitude effectively. Uh, for the upper stage, single engine, a different system would be needed for attitude control. And uh, I can get 
that information down the road. That could change, though, depending on what makes the most sense. Our launch cadences for suborbital or orbital um, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on what is feasible, depending on you know the the um, the number of people on the team and what the production line looks like, and that's all going to depend on what the economic demand is. Um, so the projections are launches twice monthly. Uh, more detail than that, I can't I can't really give right now and. To go into more detail than that, um, just predicting the future can be a very tricky business. But the plan is definitely to have a high frequency of suborbital and orbital launches. As for the question of cold gas thrusters or some other form of attitude control, um, that's another one that I can check with the, uh, the engineers on, on where the current design is. Just uh, probably not right now. Uh, if you have a technical question like that and you reach out over Facebook um, or whatever platform works, you know, I'll definitely get back and get you an answer. Uh, if email is your preference, there's a contact page on our website. Uh, you can also use marketing at blueshiftaerospace.com. And that blue does not have an E in it. Uh, that's gotten me before, so I can sympathize. Beware of spell check. But yeah, marketing at blueshiftaerospace.com. Or just our contact page. And in an interesting, totally unplanned turn of events, Falmouth High School uh, just dropped off their CubeSat. So that'll fly aboard Stardust 1.0. It's amazing to see, as it, it's, it's just amazing to see that there are school districts across the state um, participating in projects like MESAT 1 or you know being able to, to put together a CubeSat as a as a group project um, as as a student it's so important to see the real world relevance of, of the work that you're doing or, or preparing to do and uh, getting to getting to build a satellite just must be really exciting.
fact, I've got a quote here from physics and STEM teacher Andrew Nya. He said the uh, CubeSat experience is totally different from a normal science class. Our team of students got energized about Maine's place in it, got a real window into what life in research, science, and engineering can be like. The students keep up weekends and spend hours on Zoom to troubleshoot and figure out new code. CubeSats are helping them build professional relationships with scientists and professors here in Maine and around the world. That last part is maybe the most important. Never underestimate the importance of, importance of, of having a network. All right, so uh, quick update. Um, we're going to have to. Uh -huh. Sorry. So we're going to keep trying to uh, resolve the igniter issue. Uh, but we've got a hard line at, at 5 PM tonight. So there's a fair to middling chance that uh, we're going to have to call it a night, head home, and try again tomorrow. Tomorrow's our, our backup date. I'll let you know uh, as soon as we have a little bit more specific information than that. Uh, there's a question of what's on the Falmouth High School CubeSat. Um, so there's a GoPro, a radio transmitter, although uh, the last time that I spoke to them, it sounded like they might need to remove the, the radio transmitter for, uh, for, to manage power consumption. But I don't know how that turned out. So there, there may be a radio transmitter board, uh, some Xenobox chips to collect flight data, including acceleration, pressure, temperature, and humidity. So a whole uh, suite of sensors there.
So we've got an update from the CEO. Looks like there's been progress on the igniter. So the end result, um, well, let me put it this way. At my last uh, mini brief there, the odds of testing today was given at 50-50. And then in this most recent brief, it was also given at 50-50, uh, but he sounded happier. So I think there's a real good chance that we fire this engine. And as we can see, the marvel for Stratus 1.0 is now surrounded by beautiful blue and purple sunset. So uh, there are some questions about um, where to find funding for these sorts of things. Um, I do love telling people that the only thing tougher than rocket science is finding money to do rocket science. But there is help out there. Um, a CubeSat itself can be made for a few hundred to maybe a few thousand dollars, depending on what you need it to do. So that's not the hard part, especially on the scale of a school district or something like that, or a small company. Where things get trickier is the launch costs. Uh, and NASA has programs for that. For suborbital, there's the Flight Opportunities Program. And for orbital, there's the Educational Launch of Nanosatellites. Um, there are links to those and other possible resources on our website. Uh, if you scroll down and go to the resources page. Actually, you do not need to scroll down. It's right in the header. Maine has its own CubeSat launch initiative as well, uh, powered by the Maine Space Grant Consortium. So uh, depending on how the application process goes, help may be available at the state level as well as the, the federal for offsetting the cost of launch, which is usually uh, a, a, the tremendous amount of overall costs is the cost of launch. Will any of our re uh, vehicles reach vacuum or near vacuum? Uh, yes. Yes, they would. The Starless Rogue, which is our two-stage suborbital, and Red Dwarf, which is our three-stage to low-Earth orbit. Those two rockets will both get into a near vacuum. Of course, to what extent low Earth orbit counts as a true vacuum? It's uh, kind of fun to, to listen to the debate on that. Pedro, I saw your question in chat, so I'm going to 
bump that up uh, the chain a little bit. See if we can get an answer for you. In the comment section, howdy to a fellow graduate of UMaine. And our camera has switched into night mode. It's supposed to be infrared. I'm sure the sensor is infrared, but of course, the output is still in the visual spectrum for us humans. You can still see some of the deep blues and purples reflecting off the snowy ground in this top-down view of the marvel. Interesting question about getting involved in rocketry. And what's the best way to contact experts in the field? Um, I wouldn't presume to know too, too much, although there are a couple of rocket clubs across the state of Maine. So it certainly couldn't hurt to, uh, to start there. UMaine also has a chapter of students for the exploration and development of space. So you could certainly start there.
Well, if you're uh, just joining us, which I do show to be statistically unlikely, but if you're just joining us, this is the Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the. Uh, good, good, yeah. Oh, good. Uh, glowing feedback from the control room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so if you're just joining us, uh, this is the Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the static fire test of our Marvel, our modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch that will power Stardust 1.0 in flight over the Boeing Commerce Center in Limestone, Maine uh, in the coming weeks. Static fire test, so the plan is that the engine will not move, but it will fire at full power for the full amount of time that it will fire when it does eventually fly. It looks like there's been progress with the igniter, and so at this point there is a very good chance that we get a test right around 5 p.m. So spirits are, uh, are good here. Right. So for Blue Shift Airspace and Seth Lockett, this is a live stream of our static test immediately before launching. Let's 
Stardust 1.0. Got a couple of new questions in chat. Uh, new Center Main has indicated launch is December 31st. Uh, that is accurate. Our target launch date is uh, kind of New Year's Eve day, so 8 a.m. on the 31st. Uh, if for some reason we need to scrub that launch, we try again on Friday the 1st. Now, that's not uh, exactly set in stone. You know, a couple things could happen between now and then. Uh, so while we almost certainly will not launch sooner, there's always a chance that we'll wind up launching later. Uh, and those things could even just include weather. You know, if the weather's not cooperating, we need to scrub. Uh, what was the deal with the igniter? I don't have that information for you exactly. Uh, what I do have for you is uh, after checking uh, with one of our engineers, uh, it, it sounds like uh, using uh, a gas thruster system is more likely than some sort of flywheel for the upper stage of Starless Rogue. Much like our launch date, that could change. So I'm just telling you how things look right now. Hey Manny, if you're uh, watching this, this is Luke, just wanted to say hi. Cool. Uh, hope the test goes well. Engineer assisting with performance testing, oxidizer, system design and evaluation, and uh, code development, as well as staging simulations here at Blue Shift. Kind of the Wesley Crusher of the group. Question about can we fly uh, Stardust 1.0 in the dark? My understanding is that we cannot. So we would only fly while the sun is up. There's also requirements for wind speed, cloud ceiling, uh, all kinds of stuff.
Well, thanks everybody for uh, for sticking around. We're, we're back below 20 viewers on the live stream. But it's good to have you with us. And thank you so much to everybody who asked all these amazing questions. Really, really good, insightful questions. And also for the support. Uh, it's just been really nice to, to see that done through the chat, too. Just joining us, uh, Blue Shift Airspace. I'm Seth Lockman. This is our live stream of the uh, Marvel test here, static fire test of our Marvel engine we get powered. Start us 1.04 from the Limestone Color Center in the coming weeks. Uh, it's about 12 minutes of 5. And uh, the odds are standing at about 50-50 of getting a test here. If we do test this engine, fire it for 11 seconds at full power. Same as what will happen on the, uh, on the actual launch day. Major difference being that the engine is not moving any anywhere this time. Static fire test. Uh, but if the test goes well, we launch perhaps as early as next week. does not go well, we'll uh, cross that bridge when we come to it. But I've got a good feeling about this. Sunset is drawing to a close here in Brunswick.
All right. It's now after 5 Eastern. And I have not heard Scrub. So we are still proceeding with the, the test. Got an update. We are two degrees from nominal on the oxidizing tank. So we just need to heat it up a little bit more, get a little bit more pressure, and then we'll be good to test. If 
for some reason this test does not go forward, the most likely thing is that we would uh, scrub, call it a day, and try again tomorrow. Odds are good, we're less than five minutes away from the test here. For the launch event, we'll have a couple extra cameras, including several on-board Stardust. So we should be able to uh, get some, some really good views then. Pressure and temperature. So that was a tank. Ready to go. We're just going to take a minute or two here and see if we can get one of the, uh, the camera cameras online. Uh, all of uh, all of my cameras are pretty good. Here. But one of the cameras that'll get us some good engineering.
And that is a go for mission control. We are go to test. The documentary crew has launched their drone to get some aerial footage of the test. And the team is having a last minute meeting here before we begin the test in earnest. And okay, here we go. Oh, all right.
Well, there you have it. By the look of it, a very successful engine test. The team is on their way out to inspect the engine. That was amazing. That was terrific. That was a successful test of the Flight Ready Marvel. So of course our next step is a full inspection of the engine, full review of the data, and we'll move forward from there. But this bodes very well for a launch in the near future. There you have it. Phenomenal static test fire. Took a lot of work to get here. Especially the engineer's device. You know, actually turning wrenches on. Getting to this point is, uh, I don't know if a milestone calls it justice. Does it justice? Well, we're going to break things down here and uh, get ready to head home. the stream in a few minutes here. Let me just check for questions. And in the comments we have all manner of celebration. But no questions. Thank you so much 
to everybody that uh, stuck with us through to the end. The happy end. That was amazing. Even for those of us who have seen basically this exact engine fire all those times on the, on the wall, just knowing what this means, that it's, that it's ready to go. And that it's not just an ignition test, it's a, it's a static fire test. They said fire for the full 11 seconds. It wasn't just about producing max thrust, it was about, you know, hitting the, the, the operational end of the whole way. That was just uh, something else. Anyway, thanks again for for joining us, for your support, for the fantastic questions. And I uh, hope you'll join us again for the launch. So, this has been the Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the Marvel Static Fire Test. Marvel rocket engine for vehicle launch. The test was successful. And so that engine that you just saw fire is going to power a prototype rocket in flight, demonstrating the viability of a bio-derived solid fuel and our business model of helping small numbers of people get to custom orbits, you know, two to six at a time. And uh, just, a, just a momentous day, but this, uh, this concludes the live stream. If uh, you have any questions or comments, you can be reached on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, or the contact page on our website, blueshiftaerospace.com. Thanks again to everybody. Hearty congratulations to the engineering team. And we'll see you next time.